Good morning, everybody. A warm welcome to you all here. We pray the Lord will bless you today. And we also welcome anybody watching this service online. And pray the Lord will bless you as you worship at home. So it's good to see you here uh, today. The announcement sheet has restarted. Uh, that means trouble. <laughs> Uh, lots of different events taking place and trying to make sure your diaries uh, up to date and we'll take a little look at that in a moment. Can I just ask the members of the Congregational Committee to wait at the close of the service please uh, for your information. That's Andrew Blair, Victor Blair, Jackie Brawley, John Butcher, Mark Callers, Don Gilfill, Lorna Irwin, John Jameson, Jen Mark, Margaret McCurry, Warren McElmoyle, Austin Montgomery, Ernest Norris, Ernie, uh, Stephen Stewart, and Christine Wilson. So, uh, just in case you forgot or thought it was a dream whenever I read out your name previously, so if the committee would wait at the close of the service, just for a few minutes, we need to organise a, a, a date for a meeting and so on, so please bear that in mind. The other announcements are on your announcement sheet that I want to draw your attention to in terms of there's no uh, meet-up Mondays this Monday, but it restarts on the 4th of September. And then per time through the week, blood donation sessions as you see. And then next week is our Back to Church weekend. And uh, we start off with a barbecue, you'll see at 6 o'clock. Uh, there's no cost for that. But we would appreciate it if you put down your family name and the many are coming, um, just so that we know uh, how to cater for that. There's an SLN announcement, announcement as well, and that is for Saturday afternoon. And uh, you'll see details there for contacting Amber. And then Sunday school restarts next Sunday, and then um, there's tea after that. And then a special time of worship next Sunday evening. Uh, we look forward to having. Um, you'll see details of that there. And you're very welcome to come along on the 3rd on 7 o'clock in the evening. It'll be a good opportunity for us to meet in a maybe more informal way. And you're very welcome to bring friends and family along to that service. There's other announcement there for a cancer support group as well. I know the people involved in that are really good if you're interested in finding out more about that. The gentlemen have a, a Hope Explored course uh, uh, at the end of June. Um, those who were available, that was great. But uh, I've decided to run it for anybody who's interested. And so if you're interested in Hope Explored, it's on three Sunday nights from about six o'clock to about half past seven, but that includes starting with uh, a cup of tea. So that will be uh, three Sunday nights. That's the 17th and the 24th of September and the 1st of October between six and half past seven. The themes are hope, peace, and purpose. It's a really good course, really <coughs> interesting. And if you're interested, uh, please uh, let me know. I'll put your name and telephone number down on the sheet in the vestibule. Just make sure you don't sign up for the barbecue twice. There is a separate sheet for, uh, for that. So if you're interested, it's through Hope Explored. It's really good. And if you want to know more about it, then please ask me there. One final announcement is GB is going to recommence. And on Friday the 8th of September, with a registration night. Uh, that will be for new members and so on. Uh, you'd be made most welcome. And then girls and parents can attend the church hall uh, between half past six and half past seven to complete registration forms and pay fees, uh, etc. Then GB properly will run on Friday the 15th of September. So I'm giving you that as a preliminary notice. I'm looking for a GB officer. I don't see any of the ones. Um, right, okay. Um, we'll try and get that in the announcements for next week, uh, if that's all right. There's too much to read out otherwise. Um, we'll see how we go. Those are all of our announcements. We read in Psalm 28, verse 7, The Lord is your strength and your shield. In him let your heart trust. In him let your heart exult. To him, give thanks with your song. 
And so we come to worship this God in whom we have put our trust and whom we rejoice, giving him thanks with our song. Let's stand and sing our first praise. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene. I think that's a different... Am I right? Is that is right? All right, is right. Okay. Every confidence. <laughs> we'll start and worship. <laughs> Let us come to God in prayer. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we come before you today to thank you for the opportunity that we have of coming into your presence. The one who is our strength and shield. We come before you, our Father, to worship you because we put our trust in you. You have proved yourself faithful down over generations 
and even in our days, how you've preserved us and kept us, how you've heard our prayers, how you've given us peace and contentment, the knowledge of your presence through difficult times. We praise you, we thank you, we rejoice that you are our God and that we are your people. We come together, our Father, to worship you and to sing of your mercy and grace, an amazing grace, to be able to think of how much you've done for us, of how you've revealed yourself to us, we can only stand amazed in your presence. So Father, we lift to you our worship and our praise this day. We honour you and we thank you for who you are and for all that you've done. We thank you, Father, that you are a holy God, that you are absolutely, uniquely excellent above all in majesty and purity, in whom there is no shadow of turning. And so today, Father, we come before you to worship you and to rejoice in your presence, but we come with respect, with fear, because we can't come into your presence by our own efforts, <coughs> our work, but only by trusting in Jesus, and by coming in his presence. Oh, Heavenly Father, we pray that as we come before a holy God, before whom the angels worship and shout, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. We pray, Father, that you would enable us to repent of our sin. We pray that you'd enable us to turn from all that falls short of your glory. And we pray, our Father, that today we would know what it is to be able to meet you in peace because Jesus has covered all our sins with his blood. We pray that we would know forgiveness in your presence. We thank you too, Father, that you are an all-powerful God. We think of that in terms of you being omnipotent. We thank you, Father, that there is no one else like you. And from ancient times, you have said, my counsel will stand, I will accomplish my purpose. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that ultimately your will will never be frustrated because you have full power and strength. And so today, Father, we can have peace and confidence in your presence as the one in whom we take refuge and have as our shield because nothing will ever defeat you. Your will will be done. You will gather your people. You will watch over them and enable them to know your name. Bless us today, our Father. Do us good in your presence. And may all that we do in terms of our worship be acceptable in your sight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're going to read the first six verses of 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. And we're going to read from verse 1. You'll find page 1160 of the Bible in the pew, as well as on the screen. Therefore, since through God's mercy we have this ministry, we do not lose heart. Rather, we have renounced secret and shameful ways. We do not use deception, nor do we distort the word of God. On the contrary, by setting forth the truth plainly, we commend ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For we do not preach ourselves, but Jesus Christ our Lord, and ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who said, let light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. May the Lord bless to us this reading of his own word. I'm going to ask the boys and girls to come up to the front, please.
sometimes I know that feeling. <laughs> Good to see you here. Glad you're here. Hope you're glad you're here. I thought I would tell you a little bit about, over the next number of Sundays, a man called Elijah. You know any Elijahs? I met one or two. But this is about a man called Elijah. Hiya. Does everybody move up a wee bit, but just in case? Oh, my grand. You just go in the, in the back. That's it. Good to see you here. If anybody asks, with three rows of children in my room. <laughs> so it's good to have you here. I'm going to tell you uh, about a man called Elijah. We're going to have that up on the screen. Brilliant, thank you. This is uh, about a man called Elijah. A man called Elijah from a place called Tishbe. Somewhere near Ballerina. I don't really know. <laughs> but a man called uh, Elijah from Tishbe. And one day... God said to Elijah, Elijah, I've got a job for you to do. I want you to go to the king's palace and give him a message. What? said Elijah. I want you to go to the king's palace and give him a message. Elijah was a follower of God and he said, okay, I'll go. But he went and his knees were shaking because the king was a very angry man and didn't like people who believed in God. And his wife, Jezebel, well, she was a, a somebody who agreed with the king. So Elijah headed off to go to the palace and he decided that he would go and give the message that God wanted him to give. King Ahab and Queen Jezebel were people who really didn't like those who worship God and they made laws to try and stop people from worshiping God and they wanted people to worship false gods and one of the false gods that they wanted people to worship was a god called Baal but he this god was just a man made god he wasn't a real god but he made people who were sitting there uh, trying to worship God fear for their lives he tried to get them to worship false idols instead. And indeed, whenever prophets kept on talking about God, King Ahab would have them killed. So he wasn't a very nice person at all, was he? Not very good at all. And so this is the man who Elijah had to go to speak to. This was a man who thought he was in control of everything, who thought that he could do whatever he wanted because he had his own gods who he thought would do his own thing. And then he would be able to be able to say, I've made everything. Everything is mine. Suddenly, Elijah came to this king and he said, King Ahab, I have a message from God for you. He says, I serve the God of Israel and the Lord has given me a message. And he said this, because you've been so bad and because you have attacked God's prophets and because you've been trying to get people to worship false gods. It's not going to rain. And King Ahab listened to this and he couldn't believe what he was hearing. He says, Elijah says, as surely as the Lord lives, there will be no rain over the next number of years unless I command it. The king gasped. He said, I don't believe it because he believed all his false gods controlled the weather ever. And he said, no, that's not going to work. I don't have to worry too much. It'll be all right. But God then said to Elijah, no, Elijah, I want you to get out of there. I want you to go and run out into the east of the country and keep going until I tell you to stop. And he got to a little ravine and he was glad to sit down because he thought, I've passed on God's message, but that king's probably going to come looking for me. And at least out here I'm on my own. And then he had a look and he thought, I need to get a drink. And he had a drink from a lovely brook. And that was water. And he said, I'll have to get something to eat though. And then God said, I've commanded the ravens to bring you some food. And there was the Elijah sitting there. Having water beside a brook. Thinking, Ravens are going to come and bring me food. Ravens are really not kind of birds that share. If they see a bit of food, they'll eat it. 
um, before anybody else can get it. And uh, Elijah thought, I wonder how the Lord's going to do this. Ravens will come and bring me food. Well, you know, the Lord keeps his word. And in the morning and at night time, ravens brought Elijah bread and meat. And that <coughs> kept him alive. You see, God wanted him to have a message for King Ahab. And he still wanted him to be his prophet. So he was going to look after him, make sure he was okay. And every morning and every night, the ravens would ret return with bread and meat for Elijah. And that kept Elijah living and healthy. Elijah watched the sun burn at all times. The sun burned down on the king and on the people. And the water started to become scarcer and scarcer because it wasn't raining. But at least Elijah had water and he had food from the ravens. Then the sun kept on shining and it started to become obvious to Elijah. I wish that would work. It started to become obvious to Elijah that the brook was starting to run low as well. There was no rain. The people were getting thirsty. The cattle were getting thirsty. And now Elijah was getting thirsty. All the ravens were bringing food. But he had no water. Because eventually the brook ran out. Well, Elijah prayed. So he did. I'm going to stand over here. <laughs> Elijah prayed. Um, Lord, what am I going to do now? There's no more water left. What am I going to drink? What will I have to drink well, the Lord says, I have another plan now for you, Elijah. I want you to get up and leave the place we are beside that little dried up brook. And I want you to go to a place called Zarephath inside. And Elijah was shaking it, uh, scratching his head. And God says, no, I'll show you where it is. And I've commanded a widow who lives there in Zarephath to look after you. And she'll make sure that you're fed and watered. Well, Elijah had to leave that little dried up brook. He had to leave the place where the ravens were coming to bring bread and meat. And he had to go to Zarephath to go and meet a widow. I wonder, would God keep on providing for Elijah? Do you think he will? Do you think he'll keep on? Yeah, I think he will. But just to make sure, you'll have to come next week and see what happens. <laughs> Elijah had a job given to him from God. And God was going to make sure Elijah had everything necessary for that. And we'll talk more about that next week. Okay? You can go back to your seats. And then we're going to sing uh, another song. Which is Living, Loving, Lasting.
to sing a piece called He Will Keep. Thank you, that was a lovely piece, thank you. We're going to continue to worship God with our offering. Let us come to God in prayer. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we come before you, the God of heaven today, to thank you that you are the God who keeps your people, who watches over all who put their trust in you. We thank you for that day, our Father, where you called us effectually, where you called us to follow, and we responded in faith. 
Our Father, since those days you have kept your people. You have watched over us and sustained us through the days that have been up or down, through different emotions, times, challenges, you have watched over your people. Even as we have watched loved ones in the end of the day, our Father, we have seen you watch over your people. Whether we see you watching over new life, watching over the end of life, or in the busyness of a full active life, we thank you, Father, that you're the God who brings provision, sustaining power, peace, and comfort to your people. And so today, our Father, we say thank you, we worship you, and as part of our worship, we bring to you our offerings. We bring these offerings to you, and we pray that you'd take them and use them to your glory and to the extension of your kingdom. We honour you, our Father, from whom all provision comes. Our Father, we're at a time of year whenever schools are restarting, and we pray, Lord, for boys and girls who will be restarting school. They may have a, a new teacher, they may have a new school, they may have uh, new subjects, different classrooms to be in, different places to find their way around. We pray that you'd be with them. We pray that you'd watch over them. We pray that they'd be able to go to this new phase of learning and not be too worried. And we pray, Lord, that they would find that their worst fears would not be realised, but that they'd end up with a nice class of good teachers who are interested in them and value them. We pray for parents who have to leave children off, maybe for the first time to school. We pray that you'd be with them too. That's a big step. And we pray that you'd watch over our children and young people uh, in these places of learning. May they learn about not only the academic side of life, but about how to apply that learning to life and have a wisdom for life. But also realise that whatever abilities you have given them, they need you. And we pray that in these school days that you would travel with our children and young people and that you'd watch over them and bless them. Be with our teachers as well as they start a very busy season with all of the work that has to be done, not only in class, but also after school as well. We pray that you'd bless them. We pray that as parents we would be supportive of teachers and helpful to them uh, in these days. We think of young people who are making arrangements for going back to university. For some, it will be a big move for them for the first time. For others, it will be going to a new year and a new development. Maybe having to move out of halls and into uh, private rental places, making that further step. We pray, Lord, that you'd be with them and watch over them as they make these preparations. And we pray that you'd be with those, especially that are having to travel away from home. We pray that you'd watch over them and their parents. Father, we also pray for those who are in employment these days. The workplace is never an easy place. The workplace is a place where there's always more pressures growing as new uh, ways of working have to be found, new software has to be understood and updated and all sorts of uh, technical support has to be provided. Pray, Lord, you'd be with those who work today. Help them to be able to keep on top of the job they're given. But we also ask that as <coughs> they live their lives in a very close proximity to their workmates, that you would enable them to reflect the love of God that they themselves profess. We pray that you'd help them make wise and good decisions. We pray, Father, that they may live a life in such a manner, in such a caring way, that others that they work with would know that these folks have been with Jesus. Father, we pray that you'd help us not to live and move in our own strength, but to rely upon you, to be familiar with your word, to be familiar with you in terms of prayer. And we pray that as we move through our days, that we would also be familiar with your presence. Father, remember those who care for loved ones that are not well today. Whatever age, illness can come. And we pray, Lord, that you would grant strength 
unstickability to those parents who are caring for children who are unwell. We pray, Lord, that you would be with those who need wisdom to make decisions for older members of the family. We pray that you'd watch over them as well. And we pray that whatever stage of life and family experience that we're in, we pray that we would know the presence and the peace of God. We thank you, Father, that you are our God through all the days of a new life, all the way through to days of grey hair. Our Father, we thank you that our church is involved in overseas work as well as work at home. And as the church does work overseas with different partner churches, whether with the Presbyterian Church or with other mission organizations, I pray you bless those that you've called from our church as they go into other parts of the world. May they know on this Lord's Day the presence, the peace and the strength of God today. We also thank you for the outreach that there is through different mission agencies attached to the Presbyterian Church at home. We think of specialist services as well, those who work in Carlisle House seeking to uh, help those who have suffered from uh, substance abuse. We pray, Lord, for those who work in Thompson House, where they're engaged with people who have been through the justice system. We pray, Lord, that you would watch over the outreach of our church in these very practical areas uh, at home as well as the work that we do through churches. We pray, Father, that this holistic interest in people would be something that would bear fruit and bring glory to your name. So Father, we pray you'd watch over us today. For those who are nervous, afraid of what the future brings, we thank you that we come before an eternal God. And we pray that you'd meet with us where we are and the way of confidence that you will keep your people. Hear our prayers today, we ask it in Jesus' name. We are going to praise God by singing all my boast is in Jesus. We'll stand and worship God. <coughs>
So we're turning to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 4. You'll find it on page 1160. I think it's worthwhile looking up in the Bible and the pew and keeping it open if for no other reason that you have a look at verse 6 and try and figure out the depth of the meaning of that verse, which is extraordinary. But we'll come to that shortly. I wonder are any of you colorblind? You don't have to put up your hand, it's fine. Um, it's an interesting idea, isn't it? To be colorblind, to see the world differently than how it really is. I wonder if you are colorblind, how you found out you were colorblind. Was it by listening to other people who were describing the world in a different way to which you would see it? How did you find out? It's an interesting one, isn't it? If you're in the world on your own, how do you know you're colorblind? You might just think you're seeing the world as it is. And then other people start to come. They talk about the vivid colors and you're not seeing that kind of picture at all. If you're colorblind, I think, <coughs> no medical training, but I think you really need somebody else to come and tell you the world looks different. You need to have information that the world is different to how you see it. And then you might wonder, whenever you start to realize that the world is different to how you see it, how can you fix it? And the answer is, you can't really fix it yourself. No, you, you need someone, some kind of outside intervention to be able to correct that color blindness. You need some of those color blindness correction glasses to see how things really are. And indeed, there's videos on the computers today that will show you people being presented with these glasses and the reaction that they have to seeing all of a sudden how the world really is. It's quite brilliant to see. There's another kind of person who sees the world differently to how it really is and they're called sinners. You see, we look through the eyes that we have that are tainted by sin and we can't really see the world as it is. We think we're the boss. We think we're in charge. We think we are able to make the most of what we have in front of us with our own wisdom and we think we're okay. The problem is we're not seeing the world as it really is. And what we need is the light of the gospel of Jesus Christ to shine in our darkness, as we remember at Christmas, and show us how the world really is. And then allow us to see that the change can only be made from an outward perspective, an outward intervention. That's the work of God alone. The amazing thing is, the Bible tells us that left our own devices, we would always choose to be left alone, to be our own bosses, to make our own choices and priorities. People don't even like to hear that message, do they? They want to think that they are able to have an input for change for the future. Uh, but the reality is that the Bible, that you're quite helpless. In fact, we're described as being dead in our trespasses and sins. People don't like to hear the message that God has to intervene. If we're going to be able to meet him in peace, we can't meet him part way there. He has to do it all. And if anybody today is able to say about how I became a Christian, they actually have to put it in terms of not how I chose God, but how he called me and intervened in my life first. People don't like to hear that message. And the Apostle Paul was attacked in his day for that. The religious Jews wanted to be able to see how they had to keep all of the rules of Moses in order to present themselves before God. And they weren't sure about this kind of idea of it's only by Christ alone that we can come into the presence of God. Paul faced all sorts of opposition, slanderous attacks, disappointing reactions from the Corinthians, but he kept going because of the mercy of God. Paul was very hurt by these accusations. He wasn't indestructible. He didn't abandon his ministry. He didn't give up on the Corinthians. Many people crumble in the face of adversity, but 
Paul knew God was with him, that God would provide for him a bit like Elijah, then he would find the best way to minister for God and serve him is to keep in step with his word. Not to manipulate people, <coughs> not to deceive them, but to speak the truth plainly. And that's what he does, even as he faces opposition. There's two aspects to his ministry that we see in verses 1 to 6 of chapter 4. Two aspects. One is his method, what he was doing, what he was about, and the other one is the content of what he was saying. And we're going to look at that. Uh, the content, but first of all, the method. And the method about how he goes about all of this we see in verses 1 to 4. He talks about since through God's mercy we have this ministry, we do not lose heart. Rather, we have renounced secret and shameful <coughs> ways. We do not use deception, nor do we distort the word of God. On the contrary, by setting forth the word plainly, we commend ourselves to every man's conscience. In other words, even if they're disagreeing with Paul, they know he's being true. And we do it in the sight of God. That even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so they cannot see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ who is the image of God. <coughs> this includes his method. Paul describes his ministry in different places. In uh, chapter 3, verse 9, he describes it as a ministry of righteousness. In chapter 5, verse 18, he describes it as a ministry of reconciliation. And in chapter 3, verse 8, he describes it as a, a ministry of the Spirit. One commentator says this, By means of the ministry of the new covenant, the people now have a boldness in the presence of God. You've got that righteousness from God. The freedom through the Spirit to turn to the Lord, that's the ministry of reconciliation, and then to be transformed into his moral and spiritual likeness. That's the work of the Spirit. So there's a wholesome aspect to the ministry that Paul has. But even as he's carrying that, out that ministry, there are five, at least five things alleged against him, which we see in those first four verses. Uh, he says, we do not lose heart. Why is he saying that? Well, he's been accused of having lost heart. Do you know the way the angels appear before the shepherds and they say, don't be afraid. Why do they say, don't be afraid? It was because obviously the shepherds were afraid. And here he says, we don't lose heart. He's been accused of losing heart, of being demoralized, of, of quitting Corinth, and then quitting Ephesus, and then becoming depressed in a state of mind. And he says, we did not lose heart. He rejects that. There's a claim that he has acted in a secret and shameful way in verse 2. He says, we have renounced secret and shameful ways. He indicates that he's not guilty of these things, of being dishonest and devious. And he goes on to say in a third way that he doesn't use deception. In verse 2, their specific charge, which you'll see in chapter 12, is that he had been coming in there saying, oh, I'm not trying to be a burden to you. And it was all about trickery and trying to get them to give him more money. But he's not been deceptive at all. We also see then he's not distorting the word of truth. Oh, sorry, the word of God. There were lots of Paul's teachings that were about Jesus and the righteousness we find in him. And because he was bypassing, if you like, the idea of Moses and the Old Testament covenant, lots of people were saying you're distorting the word of God. He says that's not true either. And finally, he's uh, accused of obscuring the gospel. That this gospel is veiled, you'll see in verse 3. The reality is that if you say today, I just don't see Jesus, I just don't understand that, it's veiled from me, I can't understand this. That is a sign that you're perishing. The New Living Translation puts it very well. If you're veiled in terms of the gospel, you're, it's a sign that you're perishing. 
that you're lost. And Paul knew there was lots of struggles in the gospel. But it wasn't because he was veiling anything or leaving anything unsaid. So how does Paul respond to these accusations? What about the accusation of being demoralized? Well, he answers that and says in verse 1, Therefore, through God's mercy, we have this ministry, present tense. He's involved in this ministry now. He hasn't quit. And not only has he uh, visited Corinth, but he has written to Corinth. There's another visit pending. His ministry is ongoing. He says these accusations of you trying to make me demoralized and so on are not true. I'm still active. I'm still working. I'm still here. I'm still persevering. <coughs> and we do not lose heart. This phrase for losing heart is where you would show cars, give up and run away. That's the idea behind it. He says no. In view of God's mercy, I'm sticking at this. And that's where we get our stickability. In Jesus, clinging to him, holding on to him. Whenever things are not going the way we had hoped, even for his glory. Whenever people are not responding as we would have wished, we do not lose heart. We have experienced the mercy of God. He has given us this opportunity. And we'll use whatever opportunities we have to glorify him. There's accusations of him being secret or devious. And we see him answering that in verse 2. He says he sets forth the pl truth plainly. That's the best way to do it. Not dress it up in verbose language, but speak the truth plainly. He puts his uh, opponents in a difficult position. But they try to come back at him. Even though they know he's been truthful. Sometimes you'll find that somebody is attacked by people. Their characters attacked. Their methods are attacked. And whenever you try to defend yourself, the accusation then becomes, ah, look, he's commending himself or commending herself. No, here he says that we have not been involved in anything shameful. We haven't called bad, good, and so on. We haven't said that God calls sin is okay. We're not involved in secret or shameful things. We're not showing deception so that we can try to get more.